And so, so um, uh, I was doing comparative pharmacology uh, research and had a grant from the National Institute on Drug Abuse to study actually a different kind of hallucinogen, ketamine, which is not a serotonergically mediated compound. And we and we switched uh, the study and decided to uh, look at psilocybin instead and amounted a comparative pharmacology study to see whether or not psilocybin could occasion meaningful experiences of a spiritual type. And I, I would have to say, well, there are, there are a couple of things. One, in undertaking the study, um, it was a long shot because these drugs had actually not been studied for almost 30 years in the United States, and certainly that long in people without histories of any prior exposure. And and this was just because of uh, what happened in the 1960s and the demonization of these compounds and the uh, after bad actors like uh, Timothy Leary so undermined uh, a methodical scientific approach to studying these compounds. And for, for a period of decades, it was simply thought that these drugs were too dangerous to study in humans. And so we looked carefully at that literature and decided that um, that needn't be the case. And we made uh, arguments to our IRB, that's our ethical board at, at Hopkins, and to the Food and Drug Administration that also has to approve these kinds of protocols, and they weighed the risks and benefits. And uh, credit to Hopkins, they they concluded that uh, that we we should proceed with this study. There are lots of safety measures built into it, so we proceeded. And this was about uh, 2000 that we got final approval to to launch our first study, and it was conducted in uh, volunteers uh, who were healthy. Uh, normal volunteers and had no history of prior exposure to any of the classic hallucinogens. And we did that for a couple of reasons. One is that we didn't want to bias our subject group coming into the study and, and select only those people who had had positive experiences with these compounds because someone who, who had had a negative experience obviously wouldn't, uh, probably wouldn't volunteer for a study of this sort. And we also thought that um, bringing in naive volunteers would increase the likelihood uh, that we could blind the study effectively. And we went through and we went through a number of procedures to blind people to keep them confused about the nature of what was being administered. And I won't go into those details unless you want me to. But uh, um, but in fact, everyone knew that they were going to get some dose of psilocybin at some point over two or three sessions, but they were blinded to other drugs that could be administered, doses that could be administered. And in fact, what we did in our first study is just compare a pretty high dose of Ritalin, methylphenidate, a stimulant, with psilocybin. But um, people had all kinds of other ideas about what they might get, including, I should say, the monitors who prepared the volunteers for the uh, sessions and were and we're with them throughout the session. So to me, that's terrific to hear because what you just described, and this is one of the things that, that I, as a, a science minded person, as, as a skeptic, want to see double blinded studies. And what you just described is exactly what good science is when you have uh, not only controls on the, the potential placebo effects and expectations and confirmation biases of the people in the study, but those of the people administering it, that when you're looking at the data, you're actually looking at controlled good data. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you for that comment. And, and you know, there's still limitations in that, in the double blinding, because people knew they were going to get psilocybin at some point. But never having experienced psilocybin, they didn't know what that would feel like. And, and, and that because they thought they could get a variety of other drugs... Yeah, so that was the nature of the blunt. Well, so, um, and, and the study, I might add, also was designed just to be a, a straight-up uh, comparative pharmacology study because I personally um, 
was not convinced that uh, psilocybin would necessarily produce anything that was going to be of interest uh, at uh, certainly at the level that I was experiencing experiences through my own meditation practice, which at that point, uh, you know, was a, a, a stable and very nourishing practice to me. Um, so I, so I came into this study in some ways really quite agnostic with respect to outcome. And I was fine if, 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 <laughs> if the study uh, didn't show anything very interesting, that was okay. I, I had my meditation practice. I had no intention of, of, uh, abandoning that. And I, and, and so I didn't come as an, in as an advocate. Well, the bottom line of the study is that, um, uh, is that, uh, people, mo- most people in the study ended up having experiences, uh, that really match on to what uh, has been called historically the primary mystical experience. That's an experience that's been described by uh, mystics and and other people throughout the ages. And it's uh, and the, and there's a, a established phenomenology of that experience, and I'll describe that in just a second. Uh, and uh, and these experiences can be uh, can be very life altering. And uh, the majority of our volunteers had experiences uh, of that type. So, so let me just say something about the nature of the mystical experience. So that's it's been described now um, very well by people in the psychology of religion, starting incidentally with uh, William James, the famous American psychologist, back in 1902 when he wrote in Varieties of Religious Experience and talked about uh, the nature of mystical experience. And then other authors, and, and one in particular, William Stace, uh, back in 1960, uh, uh, really developed a very nice phenomenological description of, of these, these altered states. And, um, and then subsequently, the people in the psychology of religion started working with them and have developed sets of questionnaires that assess these kinds of experience. And Ralph Hood in particular uh, developed a questionnaire called the mysticism scale. It is really designed to measure spontaneously occurring or naturally occurring mystical type experiences. So what, what are the features of these experiences? So the, the hallmark feature of the mystical experience is the sense of uh, unity, sense of the interconnectedness of all people and all things, a sense that all is one, sometimes can be described as uh, as the void, uh, sometimes can be described as uh, a merging or interconnectedness with all people and things, sometimes described as a sense of the aliveness of all things. Um, so that's kind of the core experience, and that's accompanied by a sense of sacredness or, or deep, deep reverence, uh, a, a noetic quality, a sense that the experience is more true and more real than everyday waking consciousness. There's a there's an authority to the experience that actually accounts for why the memory of the experience uh, is is sustained with such fidelity. The other features of the experience are a positive mood, very often a sense of heart opening, love, universal love, peace, tranquility, uh, a sense of transcendence of time and space. So time collapses into the present moment and the future and past disappear. Space becomes vast infinitely vast. And uh, the the final um, quality of these experiences are they're ineffable at their at their core. So one of the first things that people who have an experience of this sort say is, I can't possibly put that into words. And um, and so using a hood scale that had been developed to assess these naturally occurring experiences, we showed that psilocybin uh, produced experiences of of this type. 
in a high proportion of our volunteers. Now, I might back up. There was one study, and a very important study, back done in 1962 by Walter Pankey, who was um, a minister and uh, and uh, doing a Ph.D. thesis uh, at Harvard, who gave psilocybin to 20 divinity students uh, on Good Friday, during a Good Friday service. And there were many limitations of that study, but his conclusions were not, uh, uh, were essentially in line with ours. The, but he did it as, as a group study with a lot of confounding of expectancy in it. Um, so, uh, so in one sense, for those, for those people who had this, um, view of the possibility of psilocybin, we were simply replicating the uh, Pankey study from where I sat <laughs> as essentially a skeptic and a disbeliever. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, was, I was kind of, you know, uh, blown away by it. Now, so what was it that impressed me? Well, you know, I would, I would go into people after each session and I would interview them, you know, so what, you know, tell me about what happened. And the, you know, very often the first thing that they would say is, I can't tell you. I can't possibly put it into words. And I would think to myself, okay, that's, you know, checklist one. They got that one right. <laughs> and then kind of halt, you know, haltingly, uh, you know, I would be speaking to what I felt was a newly minted mystic. You know, they were grasping for, for metaphor and for descriptive phrasing to describe this indescribable. And, and very often, as they put it in their own words, these features of the primary mystical experience would come out and they would say, you know, a sense of interconnectedness, love. It was sacred, you know, and a, and a deep sense of knowing. Very often they would say it's a homecoming. I've been here before. I knew this was true. I knew this was true all along. And, uh, and this just confirms what I know to be true. Now, I, I guess I failed to mention that we did recruit in people into the study who had active interest in spirituality. We have not conducted this um, uh, study in, uh, in uh, uh, atheists or, or people who would be closed to a worldview that, that uh, would not allow uh, uh, any interest in a sensibility of of what we call uh, sacred, um, and and that's and that incidentally is a very interesting uh, study to run. So one of the most compelling things about the study was not so much. So we had this phenomenology; they all reported this experience. Okay, that's that's nice, and they said it was interesting and important. What was what really was remarkable to me is two months after sessions, we would then bring them back in and interview them again and take some more uh, data from them. And this was prior to an, another session. They had ended up with two or three sessions over the course of the study. And the first few volunteers we had come in, you know, I'd say, well, when you think back about it, you know, tell me, you know, tell me about the experience. And they would say, essentially, it was one of the most meaningful experiences of their lives. And, and I would say, well, you know, well, what? What does that mean? Uh, you know, th- thinking that <laughs> these were, well, and I, I guess I should say too that the, the volunteers as a group were a group of high functioning, very competent, highly educated people. So most had, I think over half had, uh, postgraduate degrees. Um, most were employed full time, you know, as professionals, we had ministers and psychologists and nurses and business owners. So this was a, a group of high functioning people. But when they said this is among the most meaningful of their lives, I was thinking <laughs> maybe, they, maybe they've led pretty sheltered lives. But, but then they would, <laughs> com- they would compare it literally to you and say, you know, it's, you know, when my, when my eldest child was born, that changed my life forever. And they say, you know, recently my father passed away and, uh, that was huge for me. It's kind of like that. It's kind of like that. 